I would like to thank the organization of this event for everything and for having us here. Uh, and this round table is about cinema, utopia and propaganda. So we'll be debating the role of cinema in the context of African independences, considering its emancipatory potential and the risks of being merely a propaganda tool. Um, well, I'm going to, to, to present some ideas about this, this theme. I'm not a specialist, actually. I work with colonial cinema, and I made some research about Angolan cinema after the independence, but, well, I'll try to give you some ideas about it. So, filmmaking de dedicated to the colonization was theorized by the Argentinian filmmakers Fernando Solanas and Otavio Gettino in their manifest thou th Thwarts uh, Third Cinema in, on, uh, of 1969, in which they mapped the cinema of Hollywood, author filmmaking, and a cinema dedicated to decolonization, and they proposed a new organization of the world of cinema broken down into three categories, first, second, and third cinema. In a later development of their ideas, Solanas and Gattino defined militant cinema as a filmmaking by collectives dedicated to particular revolutionary political organizations. The films themselves were not defined as radical in relation to experimentation with film language, rather its use value or instrumentalization to a revolutionary political agenda determined by the, the significance of the film. So, fueled by Gettino and Solana's ideas and further encouraged by leaders of African independence movements, waves of revolutionary ideology swept across Latin America and Africa, leaving in wake a cinema that confronted dom dominant historical, colonial, cultural, and ideological norms in society and cinema. Latin America, Cuba, North Africa, French-speaking and Portuguese-speaking Africa, especially Mozambique, became major centers for the theoretical and practical development of cinema. As Claire Andrade Watkins has point out, pointed out, Portuguese colonies shared the legacy of a harsh and impoverished colonial reign and didn't really possess cinema production infrastructures nor trained technicians. For that reason, the development of film production was not easy during the liberation struggles or after the independence of, form, of former Portuguese colonies. Cape Verde and São Tomé Prince, for instance, nev were never able to trigger the creation of a national cinematography. Nevertheless, some liberation leaders had concrete ideas about the ways in which the ongoing struggles could use film both as a tool for education and as a means of documenting and disseminating information about their fight. For instance, Emilcar Cabral, the head of PAIGC, sent four young Guineans, Flora Gomes, Sana Narrada, Josefina Crat, and José Bulama Kubumba, to study at the Cuban Institute of Cinematographic Art and Industry between 1967 and 1962. After their return to Guinea, they immediately started shooting, although most of the footage they filmed throughout the country remained unedited. The Luta Cacabainda project made accessible what was left of this short phase of Guinea-Bissau's militant cinema. With the help of Flora Gomes and Sana Narrada, because Krat and Kubumba are already dead, the artist Filipe Cesar has been able to ensure the preservation and digitalization of the archival material. In what concerns Angola, Mario Pinto Andrade was fundamental in bringing about, after her cinema studies in Soviet Union, Sara Maldoror's commitment to the struggle waged by the M MPLA. Uh, her adaptations of Luandinos Vieira's stories about the brutality of Portuguese colonialism and colonial incarceration, Monangambe and Sabizanga, established Maldoror as a major filmmaker who best represented the Angolan liberation struggle. 
After the independence, some key films were made in Angola by the Instituto Cubano de Arte e la Industria Cinematográficos and the French filmmaking collective Unicité, which was affiliated with the Parti Français, uh, Parti Communiste Français. However, the countries of the Eastern Bloc also produced several reports about Angolan independence, especially Yugoslavia, which had given assistance to MPLA, MPLA during the armed struggle. As for Mozambique, the Frelimo was aware that it had to make its own propaganda in order to contribute, sorry, I, I lost myself, <laughs> in order to counter that of the Portuguese. Frelim used films to show its commitment to defending the people's rights and in building a new society. As the liberation movement did not have any trained filmmakers itself, it invited foreign film crews that were sympathetic to the movement's demands and actions. In 1963, the Yugoslav filmmaker Dragutin Popovic directed Vincremsh, We Shall Win, which documented daily life in the liberated zones. In 1971, Margaret Dickinson made Behind the Lines, one of the defining films about Frelimo's struggle against Portuguese colonialism in Mozambique. Similarly to what happened with regards to the Angolan liberation movement, particularly MPLA, but also FNLA, and to the Guinea SPIGC, television broadcasters and foreign organization sent film crews to interview Frelim leaders, such as Edouard Mondlane and Samora Machel, and to register the efforts being made in terms of health care, education, and military training. The Swedish filmmaker Lennart Malmer, who had also filmed in Guinea, directed Na nossa terra as balas começam a florir, in our country the bullets, the bullets begin to flower, which was a Frelim slogan. In his book, Os Moçambicanos Perante o Cinema e o Audiovisual, Guid Convent states that these films always reflected Frelim's political and propagandistic strategy and were devoid of any critical sense regarding his own policy and action. I'm sure that our, uh, per the participants in this round table will share val valuable information on what happened after the independence when Godard, Jean Rouge, uh, Rui Guerre, as well as other foreign filmmakers arrived in Mozambique to help create the Mozambican uh, cinematography. Apart from this, it's well documented that Russia provided military support to many Africa, African liberation movements, sometimes via Cuba. But what has been harder to trace is how this friendship translated into affinities between Soviet cinema and African filmmaker based on the embrace of African filmmakers by some of the filmmaking schools in Soviet Union, Ousmane Samben, Sarah Maldoror, Suleiman Sissé and Ab Abderrahman Sissako, uh, all studied in Moscow at the Gera Geramis ah, Gerasimov Institute of Cinematography, known as Vzik. Why did African filmmakers have to go to Soviet Russia for film training? Well, I already told you in the case of uh, Portuguese colonies, we didn't uh, have any infrastructures there. And the African filmmakers started being invited to the Soviet Union in the 60s because, well, in fact, they wanted to, 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 to make films, but the French uh, administration uh, also was, was not very interested in having African people uh, studying cinema and making their own films. So the Soviets would provide filmmaking equipment and mobile film units to socialist countries to encourage their national cinemas, and many students were from West Africa. The option was, in fact, to go to Soviet Russia, where film was a way to encourage socialism. But Soviet Russia also wanted to promote a certain aesthetic that would fit with the, goal, the global socialism that they, want to, they, they were promoting, they, they want to promote. And I find that in the... I, well, I, I find very interesting an idea that Jean-Michel Froudon wrote about in his book, The National uh, La Projection Nationale, in which uh, Jean-Michel Froudon uh, he states that the cinema and nation both need projection in order to exist. And so the new African nations needed people able to make films in order to help the new nations 
to, to exist also, because they needed to be projected. So, I, I would like to quote Basia Cummings that, and her proposition. Either for diplomacy, uh, diplomacy, advocacy, as a form of soft power or as a means of propaganda, it is clear that cinema was a tool through which the Soviet Union wanted to extend itself. Through images, it saw its own expansion into Africa. So, what emerges from an investigation into African filmmake, filmmaking and its relationship with the Soviet Union, particularly in West Africa during the 60s and 90s, until the 90s, and cinema cultures in Lusophone countries in the 70s, is a cine geography, a concept which she, she, she picks from Kodbu Eshun, of socialist friendship. And, Basi Cummings considers that the Russian film archive is now, in her opinion, the place to go, and that one must look at Alexander Smarkov's work of reconstructing an attitude towards Africa through images that were produced at the time of liberation struggles in post independencies So, I would like now to present Alexander Markov, which is going to... to to make a presentation about his films and his uh, ideas about, uh, about uh, well, his proposition. And um, first, uh, first of all, Alexander Markov is a documentary filmmaker, cinema historian and artist. He directed films in St. Petersburg and abroad, and he teaches documentary directing at St. Petersburg State Institute of Film and <coughs> Television. He also works as an independent curator, and his films were presented and awarded prizes at various international film festivals. So thank you, Alexander Markov, for being here and for uh, sharing with us, uh, sharing some ideas with us. <clears throat> Firstly, thank you for inviting me to Lisbon. Um, so, and... Um, mm, I will say you that I have chosen uh, as examples uh, the most typical and striking pictures, uh, pictures that um, typify, typify uh, particular decades, the um, uh, 50s, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s while uh, simultaneously like a matrix uh, bearing the command rates uh, that market all the films of the uh, Cold War era. Um, so, um, at the beginning um, of my report, I, I, have, I have to show one fragment, uh -huh. one fragment uh, from the uh, classical Soviet propaganda film. Uh, why? Because one of the way for me to understand the rhetoric um, of the Soviet film language um, in the context of in the context of representation of African countries is to look um, to, um, at the history of uh, Soviet cinema. <clears throat> um, Maybe you know the um, Soviet director Esther Shub, um, the premiere of her film The Fall um, of the Romanov uh, Dynasty took place in 1927 to mark the 10th anniversary of the October Revolution. Um, the Tsar, uh, his family and most of the people in the film had already been dead for several years. Um, the frames were filmed for uh, entirely different purposes. The Imperial Newsreel Department, the prototype of today's Newsreel bulletins, documented events in the lives of the Imperial family and subjects of the Russian Empire. classical um, manipulations in the history of Soviet cinema um, from the Soviet uh, direct standpoint, the imperial family. 
family uh, buries its people, uh, and the revolt of the masses is inevitable. So this is um, why I use their uh, intertitles in my installation, because also because of Ethel Shub. <laughs> she also the Soviet director. She used uh, their um, intertitles, yeah, in the silent cinema. But it, it was of course the silent cinema. So. Um, 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 I will also uh, show you uh, um, the sentence from the day book of this Sergei Eisenstein. This our cinema first and foremost, a weapon to be used to combat hostile ideology. Uh, this is also um, a very important sentence to understand um, why uh, the Soviet filmmakers uh, made the films like that, this way. Um, um, in the one side, there were a commission, so um, um, on another side, uh, there were filmmakers with his own point of view. Uh, uh, so, and um, if we are talking about pro propaganda and utopia in the Soviet cinema, then um, we also see their um, beautiful uh, professional images of the Soviet filmmakers. And uh, this is their, um, this is a link um, to propaganda, but also to the art of filmmaking. I will show you one clip um, uh, from their uh, Soviet filmmaker, um, Alexei Aldohin, uh, who filmed his, his first, uh, first film after uh, he finished at Evgik in 1960 in Mali. He was only five days in Mali, uh, was a cameraman and director, and uh, I think uh, he combined uh, some kind of propaganda or his own feeling of African independence, of independence of Mali with their, um, his art of um, filmmaking. So let's see. I, I think it's an interesting example that not, not only propaganda are in this film. So, just. <laughs> 
И, конечно, танцуют. Танцуют с упоением, со страстью. Так, как умеют танцевать только в Африке. From film to film, um, the rhetoric of the 1917 October Revolution, uh, which had uh, liberated workers and peasants from the yoke of uh, landlords and capitalists, was projected onto the opposition between colonizers and colonized, or slave traders and slaves. I will show you there. Are Presentation. <coughs> this is the picture from the film Where Are We See You, Africa? Uh, you can see. Yeah. So, and uh, what is important? Uh, ah, okay. mm -hmm. The comparison uh, between 1960s Africa and 19th uh, century Russia played an important uh, part also in Khrushchev's rhetoric uh, and in documentary films. Uh, and one remark, uh, maybe you know that we have in our, um, uh, in our but in Soviet um, film history, we have two uh, directors called Roms, two Roms. I mean, first Rom is Mikhail Rom, the teacher of Tarkovsky and their uh, um, famous director. So on the second Rom is Avram Rom. Uh, Avram Rom uh, was the also very important Soviet uh, director, and in in 1924 um, um, he had filmed the abstracts of the Sixth Congress of Bolsheviks. Um, the film is not exists anymore, but an idea uh, is in, was at that time in the air. Uh, to uh, to film the abstracts of the conference, you know, it's some special. And uh, this, um, I, I mean, I talk about an influence of um, of uh, communistic ideology on their art of Soviet filmmaking to understand why they uh, make this show like in on African soil also. So. Um, this is their, um, this is their um, sentence of his speech. Um, you can read uh, from the screen. Um, and um, um, the result uh, of this manipulation by Soviet filmmakers was the uh, image uh, of um, muscular African throwing of the chains of colonialism like the chains of slavery. Uh, we can return to this picture. So uh, this image is also in parallel with Karl Marx's rhetoric uh, concerning the uh, proletariat, which he said had nothing to lose but uh, its chains. Um, for, for, for my opinion, this is the roots also, uh, this is the roots of, of romantic uh, of the 60s, uh, of romantic camera view of the Soviet uh, filmmakers um, on the uh, newly independent African countries. So. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah? 
can, can you please go back to that uh, sentence by Bruce Okay, of, exactly. <laughs> I can read. So. Uh, okay. Hmm? Mm -hmm. so, thank you so much, Alexander. Um, I will now present to you um, Raquel Schaeffer. Uh, Raquel Schaeffer is a, she's a researcher, a filmmaker, and a film curator. She holds a PhD in film and audiovisual studies from the Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris, Paris 3. 3. <laughs> University with a dissertation on, on Mozambican revolutionary cinema. She published also a book, El Alto Retrato en el document, document, ay, Documental, no, <laughs> it's a mix of languages. In 2008 in Argentina, she is currently a teaching assistant at the University of Grenoble Alp and the co-editor of the Quarterly in, of Theory and History of Cinema, La Furia Humana. Thank you, Raquel. <laughs> thank you, Maria Ducar. Uh, first of all, I would like um, um, to thank uh, Manuela Ribeiro Sanchez for the invitation to participate in this round table and Maria Ducar and Pissarra for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. So I chose a photography by the Mozambican photographer Ricardo Rangel to start this presentation. The title in Portuguese is Apetecido do Quintal de Caniço in English, desirable read backyard. Uh, this photography was taken by Ricardo Rangel in 1961, just one year after the Moeda massacre, one of the main important events of resistance ag against Portuguese colonialism in Mozambique prior to the liberation war, which started in 1964. And this image exemplifies the changing cultural forms during the liberation period. So I would just like to, to launch some lines of discussion um, about it. Um, on the one hand, it is an eloquent representation of the cultural, racial and sexual borders of the colonial system and of their manifestation on the spatial stratification and the urban segregation. Rangel's work in his wall constitutes a powerful representation of the colonial physical and even carnal knowledge and power relations inasmuch as it represents the contradictions of Mozambique colonial society and the intimate transgression of its norms. So this image makes visible the sensitive thickness of colonialism through the representation of a situation of exteriority uh, in relation to an interiority in its optical dimension. The voyeuristic appeal of watching the not figurable suggests the perversity of the colonial system paving the way to the subversion of its uh, binary hierarchies. The images establish a system of panoptic visibility, but the photography itself is the result of an operation of gazes shift, to quote the expression by uh, Frederick Jameson. Um, the colonized Ricardo Rangel shifts the gaze to the colonizer. The historical observer becomes observed, opening up the possibility of self-representation. And with regard to Mozambican revolutionary cinema, I think that one of the main problems and one of the main issues is the question of representation and self-representation. I will come back to, to this point uh, later. So uh, in this picture, despite its indexical nature, photography uh, becomes a non-reflection of the uh, colonial reality. It becomes its dialectical negation and at the same time a kind of prefiguration of the representative forms of the Mozambican society to come. <clears throat> I would just like to launch a few lines of discussion on Mozambican revolutionary cinema and the Mozambique Liberation Front, Frelimus, a uh, cultural project. In the frame of the culture of transnational liberation, which involves Africa but also Latin America, as Maria do Carmo stated, 
Uh, and in the line of thinkers such as Franz Fanon, uh, Milker Cabral, uh, Mario Pinto de Andrade, among many others, political decolonization was perceived as inseparable from the decolonization of culture, knowledge, uh, literature, and art. Uh, the filmic representations of the war of liberation in Mozambique and of the Mozambican revolution were an essential instrument for the construction of national identity. The development of cinema in Mozambique, uh, as Maria do Carmo already uh, said, uh, starts during the War of Liberation with the creation of the fil film department of the Frelimo in 1966, um, leading to the foundation of the Mozambique uh, National Institute of Cinema, INC, in March of 76. Uh, its different phases and the orientation that the Frelimo attempted to ascribe to cinema can be uh, characterized as an ambivalent process in terms of domination and emancipation. On the one hand, there is a strong desire of developing innovative film forms and of collectivizing film produce, production and this in line uh, of something uh, which was happening um, international in, in Latin America, I'm thinking about uh, certain film collectives as uh, Cine Liberación, uh, but also <clears throat> uh, Grupo Cine de la Base in the United States as well, uh, with film collectives such as the Newsreel Group, and in Europe with other film collectives such as uh, Le Groupe Medevkin de Besançon, and uh, the collective formed by uh, Jean-Luc Codard and Jean-Pierre Gorin, uh, the, news, uh, the Ziga Vertov Group, between uh, many other forms of uh, um, <clears throat> um, mutation of the modes of film production. So, uh, on the one hand, um, we have this desire of uh, developing new film forms and of collectivizing film production, um, a desire which can be seen in films such as Estas São as Armas by Murilo Sar Salles uh, and Luis Bernardo Noana, and as well in the films such as Moeda Memoria Massacre by Rui Guerra, uh, which is going to be screened uh, this evening. So, this line can be uh, regarded as uh, guided by a logic of emancipation. But on the other hand, uh, cinema pertains in the Mozambique case, and I think that uh, in other uh, Portuguese-speaking countries, to an epistemic historiographical apparatus termed the liberation script in João Paulo Borges Coelho uh, expression. There is indeed a discrepancy between the quiz instance of a project for the collectivization of film production, formal experimentation, and the premises of the state program. Uh, there are contradictory forms of relation between collective cinema, author cinema, and state cinema, and ambivalence between a logics of emancipation and a logics of domination. And I, was, I would just like to briefly formulate certain key problems of the Mozambican revolutionary cinema. First of all, uh, it's internationalism. Um, since the beginning of the Liberation War, as Maria do Carmo has already mentioned, several uh, international engaged film directors traveled to Mozambique to document uh, the process of liberation. Uh, among these directors, uh, I can mention Margaret Dixon, Robert Van Lierop, uh, Franco Cigarini, among many others. So, at the same time, uh, there is the desire of representation of the liberation struggle, but this representation, representation is in um, almost all of the cases um, conducted by international filmmakers. So there is this small department, film department of the Frelimo with two um, filmmakers, um, Arturo Turuat and José Soares, but uh, these are two persons uh, who had received a, a, a very brief training in cinema, and also from the technical material point of view, the equipment was very uh, precarious. So I think that this uh, tension between uh, representation and self-representation would characterize uh, until the 87 um, Mozambican revolutionary cinema. 
And it is a problem which uh, persisted after uh, the independence, um, namely in the projects uh, which were conducted by international filmmakers such as Jean-Luc Godard, Jean Rouge, and Rui Guerra in, in Mozambique. Um, if we think about Jean Rouge's uh, project, it was developed at the University Edouard uh, Mondelein, and the idea was to train uh, Mozambican filmmakers in order that uh, um, uh, the Mozambican um, themselves could represent uh, the revolutionary process. Um, Jean-Luc Godard's uh, uh, project um, can be defined as very close to the one of uh, Jean Rouge, um, but as Jean Rouge's project, it was a failed pro uh, <laughs> project. <coughs> And I think, um, first of all, uh, we can explain this failure because there were uh, um, a kind of technological discussion. Um, one of the main questions was uh, what would be, what should be the, uh, the um, material format of Mozambican cinema. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard uh, defended video, uh, Jean Rouge uh, super act, Rui Guerra as well uh, the super act. So there is this technological material question, but at the same time, these projects were led already in a, in a moment of uh, um, disciplinarization of the Frelimo's uh, cultural and political project. Uh, The idea was that uh, the means of filmic production uh, would be, uh, would be um, transposed to the ends of the people, and this was too radical um, in the late 70s in Mozambique. Um, just to conclude, I would like just to, uh, to mention a few points. This cinema can be also characterized at the beginning uh, by an imbrication between political engagement and aesthetic experimentation. There is a new aesthetics uh, which emerged in the INC, um, which I termed the aesthetics of liberation. Uh, but this process was evidently followed by uh, the canonization of film forms, um, the emergence of uh, an aesthetics uh, close to <coughs> socialist uh, realism uh, in the second phase of Mozambican revolutionary cinema. Um, so just to conclude, Mueda Mori Massacre, the fi Rui Guerra's film, which is going to, screen, to be screened tonight, um, and uh, mostly its uh, material history, the film was censored, it was uh, partially reshot and partially uh, re-edited, uh, exemplify uh, these issues, this film exemplifies the ambivalences of the Mozambican revolutionary process and uh, particularly of the uh, film project uh, of Mozambique. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raquel, for being so uh, um, respectful about the time. I, I'm now going to present you Margarida Cardoso, which, uh, well, she almost doesn't need presentation, but anyway. Uh, Margarida Cardoso, she was born in Tomar, here in Portugal, but she grew up in Mozambique. She studied photography at the Antonio Arroyo School of Arts like he, here in Lisbon, and she worked for several years in France and Portugal as a photographer and as, a, as an assistant director. In 1995, she started directing <coughs> her own films, exploring subjects connected to her personal experiences, as well as prominent issues in recent Portuguese history, such as the colonial war in Africa, the revolution, and post-colonialism. The documentary is Natal 71, Christmas, uh, Natal 71, Christmas 71, and Cuxa Canema, The Birth of Cinema. And the feature films, The Murmuring Coast and Ivan Kane, are amongst her best known films, and all relate to her experience in former Portuguese col colonies, as well into the corresponding post-colonial contexts. Her films have been screened in many festivals and are now subject to many debates, even in, at the academia, at the university. So thank you so much for being here with us, Margarida. Uh, thank you, me, and thank you to the organization to invite me to give my, 
my thoughts because I'm not an academic. So what I think that I can bring to this uh, discussion is something much more emotional and some more doubts, more questions than uh, analyzes, if I can say. Um, and so I will focus mostly on the um, on my experience uh, on the Kushak uh, during the 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 time when I was researching and. Uh, trying to find a form also for Kusha Kanema, the birth of cinema. Uh, most of you, I think all of you probably had see the, saw the film. Um, so I would not, I go more to the, di directly to what I can say that was my, also my path uh, concerning the questions of cinema. And cinema like, uh, like a document, cinema also connecting to these uh, doubts of uh, his own, uh, the truth that we can find in cinema, that I think that it doesn't exist, but uh, this question of cinema like a document, uh, uh, a lot of questions that arise to me during this uh, a little bit naive uh, first steps that I gave uh, when I was researching on Mozambique. The first thing is that, of course, that I, I went to visit um, the Institute of Cinema in 1998 when I was shooting the film of Solveig Nordlund, a uh, fiction film there, and then I went with uh, Gabriel Mondland, and then he showed me this institute, and of course, that I, when I saw the institute completely in ruins, and uh, these archives that uh, seem so rich, at least it was big and full of cans with mysteries films inside. I completely thought that it was uh, a subject for a film. So you have history that I like it, you have archives, you have conflict, if you can say. And I was so curious about what it was there inside. So. Uh, before I have the time and the means, uh, economical means, to go there to research, and uh, my research had take long time, more than eight uh, months that I've been there, uh, I had made a research here in Portugal and also in France because I'm very connected to, to France. But, so I have a lot of people that have been there in the, with the Atelier Vara and also uh, with uh, Jean Rouge during the, the Super 8 experience. So I know these uh, persons and I start to research and in books and I made a big list about what films could I find there on these archives. So this was my first thing. I made an enormous and uh, very uh, demanded list later on because I think that no one, I didn't know in that times in 2000, no one was really very, very focused on this uh, studying Mozambique uh, cinema, just some pe persons. Uh, so I had made this list and this uh, with all these films also d d uh, during, uh, made during the, the liberation uh, um, fight. So I had all these contacts and things like that and then I went to the institute and after a kind of terrible times when I had to find a way to see the films because it was uh, also a technical thing uh, to, to, to see the films, uh, I thought that maybe I could, uh, my film could also analyze a little bit what it will be the speech and um, the cinematic uh, language uh, of colonial um, times and also make a kind of comparative study with the, the, the new language that it was what I thought. Of course that uh, it was a little bit naive because I think that this exists and this afternoon uh, I think that you will have the opportunity to talk with Luis Carlos Patrekin and he knows a lot and it's, he's one of the persons that uh, uh, really uh, inspiring me and give me a lot of uh, tips, if you can say, to understand the, the history of Mozambique and the importance of cinema after the, the independence. Um, so I, I began to, to, to do this, but when I, uh, when I saw the first, uh, for example, comparing Kusha Kanema with the newsreels that was there, the, a lot of newsreels from from uh, the colonial times, uh, Noticias da Beira, I don't know if it's the name, but 
uh, you will check, but all these, um, these newsreels. Well, of course, that the first Kushakanemas and the first uh, steps of the Institute um, had been very influenced by, by people that have been living in Mozambique, colonial, uh, if you can say, uh, people like Luis Carlos Patraquin that have been connected to cine clubs and to cinema and cinema art cinema, if you can say. So these people had influences also the first steps of the institute. And like you can see in Kusha Kanem, uh, the my documentary, uh, uh, Luis Carlos Patraquin, there is a scene when he's seeing uh, the image that uh, of a film, and he was the person that had wrote in a lot of texts for mm -hmm. the Kushakanemas. And he was seeing this, and uh, there is a moment on the film when we see image of people constructing, building something, and then the, the text say, from the first uh, buildings, I don't know what is the first step, but then in the end it's like that, and the people fertilize freedom. And then he say, oh, fertilize freedom. This was me, of course. Uh, this was me that had written this. And we, what, I, what I encounter on these first uh, ingenuous uh, steps is that the language of uh, the construction of the narrative on the newsreels from the colonial times to um, uh, and after the independence with Kushikanema are exactly the same. The structure, if you can say the macro structure, uh, with the football in the end and everything have to be the same because people just stay in the cinema because to see, they see Kushikanema because there was football in the end, if you can say. In the beginning, of course, it was not like that, but it was a very attractive thing to have this uh, football. Um, and then you have the, all the speech, the rhetorical, the voiceover, uh, that in the beginning had a certain quality also because Patrakin is a very a good writer. I, I can, and uh, he had a very um, uh, wide vision, uh, if you can say. Um, so then after this uh, speech, if you can say, the text of this Kushakanemas degraded a lot and becomes like, then there is this... Uh, two lines that go at the same time, the history of the, the cinema from Mozambique in the first years of independence, and also the cinema, both they, after a, big, uh, in a, a, a rise on the, on the, the first years, they become to slow down and to uh, also fall, falling with this repetition of the of the propaganda speech, the nonsense of the, the propaganda speech, and become a very, in my opinion, a very poor cinema uh, in all terms. I don't know if I can call cinema to all the things that are, uh, the most of the things that I saw there. Uh, now the Cinematheque had made a kind of uh, list and we can say that there is uh, titles that we call titles to complete the films, uh, but I enjoy a lot to see during these eight months also, I enjoy to see things that have not been edited. Most of them doesn't have sound because uh, this was the technical process at the time. Sound would put then later and but I also saw a lot of things, a very beautiful uh, image and very interesting uh, content in this image that not have been edited. And uh, this was very rich to me and very rich to question, to question myself. And uh, that also uh, threw me to this investigation about the power of the image, his own fragility and his own strongs. What I, well, the, the, it's not a conclusion, but what I know is that, for example, image uh, that had been produced in terms of propaganda, even colonial propaganda, can be, and this is the example of Estes São as Armas, uh, you, you, you see on this film, you can, we can see on this film a lot of images that have been made by Portuguese propaganda, for example, for example uh, I always remember uh, Rebelo de Souza on this Rick show in Mozambique Island. That is, <laughs> I saw that when I was a kid. I saw it in the cinema when I was living in Mozambique. And then now, 
I was seeing this in the completely different context and uh, uh, somehow the importance is the, the narrative, the speech that give this importance to this image. So images are very fragile in terms that, that, that they can be used uh, in different uh, ways. It's a question of uh, uh, creating a new speech with them. And they are also very, very strong because you can see, you, if you keep them, and this is very important, and also in these terms of a Mozambique uh, archive, they are the, really the witness of something, and it's very important that they exist. They exist, uh, they are there. And we can transform them, and we can read them, uh, and the, this fragility, I think that we, this fragility exists, but this strongness that we can always uh, catch something, that it's very, put it apart on the propaganda cinema, that is the profilmic event, if you can say. I'm, I'm very, because maybe I also teach documentary, <laughs> I'm always uh, very concerned about this question of uh, profilming. That means the moment, the exact moment when we are doing this image and capturing this image, this moment where someone had put there the camera and maybe a lady was passing and talk, or maybe she didn't talk, or maybe it was raining and they ran away. This, uh, the value of this profilming for me they exist and uh, they will be always there. So I think that it was very important for Mozambique to have all this, um, the opportunity to, to film a lot, like say also Rui Guerra on the, on the, on Kusha Kanema, the, the documentary that it's, and, and Patrickin also, they state this on, on the film saying that what is, was important is to shoot everything and we, we will see later what you can do about it. And this, are the, the, the most uh, incredible and uh, that a uh, big value on the, I give a big value on this, uh, on this uh, 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 movement of doing everything, doing what we can do. Um, and during, uh, so this is the things I always, uh, what I encountered there in Mozambique after this, uh, this in this uh, moment of, uh, after the independence, is that of course that the films become so, people don't have voice, mostly there is a voiceover saying what people are saying because there is also question of translating and language. Uh, an enormous difficulty to self-representation uh, uh, because also this is also concerning to the to the question of cinema itself and this uh, staging and self staging there is no ability for that and uh, the problem is not the cinema the problem is quite far <laughs> up the cinema so cinema is just a kind of reflection of an enormous or a different and big problem of representation and self representation and um, so I was, uh, during Kushikanema, I was also, uh, if you can say, a witness, not of the past, because I didn't live this time, so I was, I was recalled, uh, recalling, um, pick the, 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 wit the, the speech and the witness of this past, but I was also in 2000 and 2001 in Mozambique in front of an, ar uh, on, on an archive that was somehow dead, and um, and this uh, archive uh, was viewed in that times. Uh, it was a little bit all the country was a little bit under the influence of uh, the post uh, civil war. So everything was a kind of mythological idea about what kind of image are inside there. Uh, it was really the if you can say the metaphor of the the the. The, 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 the moment that the country was living. People are interesting and make the first steps to see what was inside, but the power was not no more making, uh, uh, producing the image, but at the same time the power, if you can say, the state was keeping this image, and this I'm sure that it was not because what of, of, of what they contained, 
but for not destroying also a kind of mythological fear about the, the witness of this image. And it was ridiculous after when we begin to open the archive and everybody could see that it was nothing that will be blamed for. It was just, if there was a re-education camps, they are there, people are talking about this. There are people dying, of course, but uh, uh, this reconciliation that starts in 2001, and I can say that I think that it was also a bit like um, from my presence there and from taking the things out, and I didn't, uh, in fact, sorry, give a damn about <laughs> all these things that it was around saying, oh, I don't touch this, that is there, a thing that... Uh, um, it was so good when the, this image could come to, to the public, if you can say, public view, and could be analyzed and could be somehow demystificated. And so this was a, a step that I think that it was a very good to maybe, I, was, I have the, the in that times I, th I thought that it was possible to, from there, start to rebuild uh, because it was, we are now 15 years later. And what I noticed is there is no evolution in terms of uh, this question of self-representation in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. This doesn't exist yet. And um, what I think is that uh, uh, there is a lot of things to do in these terms not in terms of cinema, but in terms of, uh, and this I, I also think that is very important, the, the, um, this archive now, it's rehabilitated, it's no more a ruin, exists. And uh, uh, they are recuperating the films, they digitalize them, they could even make DVDs with these films, with Samora, and people like it, and they see. Um, and I think that this was, this is a very um, important uh, step to, um, to, to, to begin to construct an, the, a new, uh, this possibility of self-representation. But the possibility of self-representation for me have to start also to, do, to this to, to disconstruct also this idea of the script of Mozambique, like uh, the idea is not of John Paul Borges, it's from another uh, writer, you know, I don't know if you know this, yeah. this is uh, so about the cinema, uh, the script of Mozambique. It's, no, it's another person, <laughs> yes, but the first, <laughs> idea, the first uh, um, academic uh, uh, article uh, on this subject is uh, one other person that we can see yeah. later on. Um, but John Paul will also talk about this. Uh, and this, the disconstruction of, uh, of this script, it becomes slowly to, 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 to falling down. This idea that Frelimo, uh, the, the, the big victory, the Frelimo, like say Patrick in the film, Frelimo had create a world that creates <laughs> everything. Um, all this, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, guilty on colonization, uh, all these steps have to be done. And I think that this, uh, this uh, archive and this cinema that have been done there in Mozambique could help for the new generations to begin this uh, self-representation.